let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. A nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Russia at the present time is at a crossroads. The communists have been defeated, but the ideas of freedom now are on trial. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? This question is heavy with historical significance, to the point that modern media is still shaped by it today, more than 80 years after it was first asked. It all began with the lower body of the United States Congress. The year was 1938, and the American political zeitgeist was growing increasingly concerned with the specter haunting Europe. Only a century prior, the continent was ruled by monarchies, but through an impressive chain of revolutions, the nations of Europe rejected the hierarchies in place. As new social and political orders formed, liberal democracy spread across the old world, but for some, the division between capitalist and worker didn't seem far enough removed from the division between aristocrat and peasant. While the revolutions were progress, there was still work to do. Europe's far left eventually concentrated around the ideology birthed by the writings of Karl Marx, communism. By the mid-1930s, communists had seized power in much of Eastern Europe, forming the Soviet Union, and the popularity of their ideology was growing throughout the rest of the continent. As Communist Party membership rose across the Atlantic, the politicians and capitalists in the United States saw a problem. When Communist Party membership surged in the United States, they saw a threat. In 1938, the United States House of Representatives launched the House Un-American Activities Committee to investigate alleged disloyalty among private citizens. The committee took some interest in fighting fascism, but the bulk of the effort here went to rooting out communists. For the first decade of its existence, the committee did little of note, but in 1947, they found their golden goose. The committee shifted its focus to rumors of communist influence in Hollywood. 43 film industry professionals were given a choice, testify before the committee and name names or learn to enjoy life from inside a jail cell. This offer was persuasive enough that 33 of the witnesses cooperated, but we're going to focus on the other 10. It is their defiance that still shapes the movies, books, and games of today. The 10 non-cooperative witnesses, who we now call the Hollywood 10, were jailed for contempt of Congress, signaling to the studios that they needed to fall in line. They established an industry blacklist, first of just the Hollywood 10, but eventually of more than 300 suspected communists. Next was a wave of anti-Soviet and anti-communist films hitting theaters. Given the cultural impact of Hollywood and the then-brewing Cold War, the environment created by these films was one in which antagonist and Soviet were nearly synonymous. And as cinema adjusted to this new status quo, other forms of media followed suit. The trend became so ubiquitous that when video games entered the consumer market, it was inevitable that anti-Soviet themes would take root. Consider Call of Duty Black Ops. The protagonist, CIA operative Alex Mason, spends the game strapped to an electric chair, being subject to what Donald Rumsfeld might call enhanced interrogation, more colloquially known as torture. The gameplay happens in flashbacks. Mason tells the story, you play the mission. The failed assassination of Fidel Castro during the Bay of Pigs invasion, Mason's imprisonment in the Borkuta Gulag, and his mission to sabotage the launch of the Soyuz 2 rocket. Alex Mason has dedicated his career to defeating the Soviet threat, and his obsession is not unwarranted. After World War II, the Soviet Union of the Call of Duty universe began producing a chemical weapon called Nova 6. 15 seconds of exposure to the chemical is enough to guarantee an excruciating death. Soviet General Nikita Dragovich plans to release Nova 6 in all of the major cities across the United States, making the Soviet Union an existential threat. I don't like it. I don't like the trope of the big bad Soviet Union threatening the virtuous United States. It is played out to the point of laziness, and honestly, there are so many more interesting and modern ways of depicting the now defunct USSR. In the
the prologue of Pathologic 2, military forces are using machine guns and flamethrowers to wipe a town off the map. Referred to only as the town on the river, the Russian village has become ground zero for the outbreak of a mysterious and deadly plague, and the government isn't taking any chances. Orders have been issued to eradicate the town's sick to protect the rest of Russia. The game's setting is deliberately ambiguous. We know that the village is in the Russian steppe, but it doesn't get more specific. For the most part, the timeline is even more uncertain, with the town's buildings spanning multiple centuries worth of architectural movements, pinning down the when of of the game would be impossible if it weren't for a few references to the ongoing civil war. In 1917, chaos enveloped the Russian Empire. In response to food shortages and the autocratic rule of Tsar Nicholas II, protests swept through the streets of Petrograd. With even the military joining the demonstrations, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate his throne, leading to the establishment of a provisional government in Petrograd. This was the February Revolution, named as such because the Russian Revolution of 1917 is not sufficiently specific. In November, a new group sought control over the future of Russian politics. Led by Vladimir Lenin, the Bolshevik party orchestrated an armed insurrection, seizing power and declaring a new socialist government. The White Movement, an ideologically diverse confederation of anti-communist forces, raised an army to combat the Bolshevik coup, united only by the desire to unseat the Bolshevik government. With that, the Russian Civil War was underway. Pathologic runs concurrently to the revolution, representing a similar conflict between what is and what could be. The protagonist, Artemy, is a university-trained physician, and with that education came a rejection of traditional step medicine and, more generally, of the town's way of life. Though Artemy feels his worldview to be correct, the townspeople feel the same, and despite offering the promise of progress and of a better Russia, Artemy faces conflict at every step as the town's culture collides with the values of the modern world. This conflict creates a brutally difficult game, but calling it such is hyperbole for the sake of linguistic flair whereas the Russian Civil War was legitimately brutal. Hang. I mean hang publicly, so that people see it. At least 100 kulaks, rich bastards, and bloodsuckers. Yours, Lenin. P.S find tougher people. This telegram, sent by Vladimir Lenin to the governor of a region rumored to be on the verge of rebellion, precipitated a period now known as the Red Terror, in which the Bolsheviks executed tens or even hundreds of thousands of peasants, clergy, and political dissidents. Combined with the White Army's own execution campaign, the Russian Civil War saw up to 300,000 non-combatants executed, en route to an eventual Bolshevik victory and the establishment of the Soviet Union in 1922. With the White Army's defeat and the systemic eradication of political dissent, Lenin next turned his attention toward a comprehensive transformation of the country. In the setting of the game Atomic Heart, the Soviets began researching the development of autonomous mechanical devices in the year 1932. In 1936, the leading researcher, Dr. Dmitry Sekhanov, announced the discovery of a plastic energy storage device that he called Polymer. The next year, the Soviet Union launched an initiative to create a person of a new formation, free from the private and individual. The project's success would not take long, with Dr. Sekhanov announcing the creation of an autonomous robot in 1939, and, for good measure, a cold fusion reactor. In 1941, Dr. Sekhanov's success with autonomous robots was taken to an industrial scale, distributing human-like machines across the country to free citizens from manual labor. And the Soviets did not let the opportunity go to waste, becoming the sole global superpower by the mid-1950s and with plans to further cement their position. Collaborating with the Soviet government, Dr. Sekhanov began work on the Atomic Heart Project. Step one was to install a secret combat mode in every robot. Step two was to distribute the robots across the world. And step three was to remotely activate combat mode for all of the robots in the United States, permanently destroying the Soviet Union's closest geopolitical peer. A plan that likely would have succeeded were it not for Sekhanov's secret step four, enslaving all of humanity. Hoping to thwart Sekhanov's plans, a robotics engineer named Viktor Petrov activated combat mode for all of the robots at the development facility, setting in motion the events of the game's plot. 
The timeline of Atomic Heart's robotics revolution seems to align with that of the real-world industrialization of the Soviet Union, the groundwork for the transformation from agrarian society to manufacturing powerhouse was laid during the country's civil war, when the Bolshevik government introduced a plan to bring electrification to the entire country. The goal of distributing electricity across the vast Soviet Union was achieved, and so successfully that Lenin's eventual successor, Joseph Stalin, would later use the electrification initiative as a framework for his own national industrialization programs. Starting in 1929, Stalin's five-year plans birthed the emergence of the Soviet Union as an industrial and military titan during a time in which much of the Western world was in the throes of the Great Depression. Unfortunately for the Soviets, the 1940s would be a less agreeable decade. The 22nd of June, 1941, saw the beginning of the largest land offensive in the history of warfare. On orders from Adolf Hitler, nearly 3 million German troops poured into the Soviet Union. By the end of September, Kiev had fallen and Leningrad was besieged, allowing Hitler to turn his sights toward Moscow. Now, fortune favored the defending country, with the winter weather stalling the German advance, allowing for a counterattack in December that forced the German army to retreat. While the Soviets had managed to successfully protect their capital city, the battles of the Eastern Front would rain destruction upon the country until the end of World War II in 1945. By many metrics, the Soviet economy did not return to pre-war heights until the 1960s. The eventual economic rebound provides the setting for Workers and Resources Soviet Republic, a city management game set in a fictional Soviet Republic. Players manage the production pipeline for more than 30 commodities, starting with the purchase of equipment to extract raw resources and ending with the construction of infrastructure to export manufactured goods. Market forces determine commodity prices at any point in time, but internally it is a planned economy through and through. The player alone determines the development of their region. Spanning the years 1960 to 1990, the game forces the player to decide whether they want to form closer economic ties with the Soviet Union or with the NATO states in a time when the two powers were locking horns in the Cold War. In 1962, conservative think tank strategist Donald Brennan argued that it was irrational for a country to hold weapons capable of destroying society. He developed an ironic acronym to help him make his case, saying that the result of multiple countries with nuclear stockpiles is mutually assured destruction, and that those countries would be mad to hold such an arsenal. This acronym was adopted as the name of the doctrine, arguing that a country equipped with nuclear weaponry is safe from nuclear attacks because they have the ability to return fire. Atom RPG depicts a world in which MAD has failed. In the year 1986, Eastern and Western powers unleashed an Armageddon, reducing the world to ashes. The effects of the nuclear exchange are impossible to escape. Collapsed buildings litter the landscape, and the pre-war structures that remain standing often show extensive damage. The earth and food sources are irradiated, the vast majority of surviving technology is mechanical and highly sought after for its rarity. Mutations have rendered wildlife dangerous and aggressive, and even many humans were changed by the radiation. This is a world that is actively hostile to life, a world in which survival is hell. This is the world that the Cold War threatened. In a 1946 speech, Winston Churchill described the ancient states of Eastern and Central Europe as lying in the sphere of Soviet influence, being increasingly subject to Moscow's control. He explained that despite limited membership, the Communist Party in each of these states has been awarded a disproportionate amount of power. He warned that police governments have been instated, seeking a totalitarian grip over their respective borders. These countries are described in contrast to their democratic counterparts in the West, with Churchill referring to this divide as an iron curtain, a phrase that would ultimately become a metaphor for the physical and ideological division behind the Cold War. A game that puts this division front and center is Papers, Please. In Papers, Please, players take on the role of an immigration officer for the fictional but Soviet-inspired Eastern Bloc country of Arstotska. Set in 1982, the player is tasked with inspecting documents and deciding who can and cannot enter the country. 
With only a limited amount of time per day, you cannot spend too long on any individual case, but mistakes are met with harsh consequences. Such is life under an authoritarian regime that is not explicitly said to be under the thumb of Moscow, but obviously is. Control is an overarching theme here. The central government wants to control access to the country. They name you a vehicle of that control, granting you the ability to make that decision on their behalf. You are little more than a cog in a well-oiled machine designed to control others, and while papers please reflect certain aspects of what living under an autocratic regime entails, it is important to recognize that the people were not the only thing that the Soviet state tried to control. It is the forbidden fruit that tastes the sweetest, and in the Soviet Union, that forbidden fruit was the free flow of information. Censorship in the Soviet Union was pervasive, suppressing any forms of expression or information that were deemed counter to Communist Party ideology or the objectives of the state. While the censors could not directly control how knowledge was circulated in the rest of the world, the stringent measures they employed within the country's borders limited the flow of information to the global community. Still, despite their best efforts, there were things that the censors could not hide. On April 26, 1986, tragedy struck the Chernobyl power plant near the city of Pripyat, located in modern-day Ukraine. A mistake during a routine safety test caused a massive power spike in Reactor 4, leading to a buildup of steam and eventual explosion. If this were where the story ended, it's unlikely that any of us would recognize the name Chernobyl today, but the history of Russia is a set of Matryoshka dolls, each labeled Then Things Got Worse. The events of the next few seconds are a subject of debate. What is widely accepted is that, seconds after the initial blast, a significantly more powerful explosion occurred. One theory suggests that the steam and red-hot graphite reacted to produce a hydrogen explosion. Per another theory, the total loss of water led to a thermal blast. More recent speculation argues that the second explosion was the result of a nuclear fizzle event, similar to that of a nuclear bomb. Regardless, the second explosion launched radioactive fallout into the atmosphere where it spread internationally. The administration initially buried news of the disaster, only coming clean when radioactive fallout was detected in Sweden. Still, the Soviets downplayed the severity of the vent, referring to it as a minor accident. Despite understating the scale of the disaster, the Soviet government designated for evacuation everything within 30 kilometers of the plant, establishing the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. To this day, the Exclusion Zone is one of the most irradiated locations in the world, and its mystique has granted it a place in the fictional media landscape. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is a 2007 game set in the Exclusion Zone. In an alternate reality in which the plant suffered a second nuclear disaster 20 years after the first, the zone has become a locus of activity for opportunistic treasure hunters, referred to as stalkers. The player takes the role of a stalker six years after the second disaster. The layers of radiation have rendered the landscape unrecognizable from its real-world counterpart, but hidden beneath the mutated exterior is a certain structural familiarity. Scattered throughout the fictionalized Pripyat are a number of real-life landmarks. The heavily irradiated Red Forest, Avenard Stadium, and even the Ferris Wheel that has become a metonym for the disaster. The player can visit Pripyat's tallest building, the Policia Hotel, though it is perhaps more well-known for its presence in Call of Duty 4. Then, of course, there is the power plant itself, the Chernobyl complex, the infamous Reactor 4, and the sarcophagus built over top to entomb the failures of the Soviet Union. Cut from a nearly identical cloth is Chernobylite, a survival horror game in which the player steps into the shoes of Igor, a former Chernobyl physicist surging the exclusion zone for his lost fiance. Chernobylite ups the ante on creating an immersive depiction of the zone, using ultra-realistic photogrammetry scans to create a replica with an astonishing level of detail, juxtaposing lifelike beauty with the remnants of catastrophe. In both games, the Soviet Union's legacy serves as a foundational backdrop, informing the narrative and atmosphere of each. Both titles thrust players into environments marked by Soviet-era infrastructure, iconography, and ethos. Stalker paints a picture of a post-Soviet wasteland, influenced by the ambition and failures of the USSR, and Chernobylite sets a tale of loss and intrigue against the backdrop of Soviet science and the state's obsession with control and secrecy. Both games are heavy with the weight of the Soviet Union's historical footprint. Jalopy is a game about, um, I don't have any idea. 
That's not entirely true, but it's complicated. Set in the Soviet Union in the year 1990, the player embarks on a road trip with their uncle through several Soviet republics. The bulk of the gameplay involves simply driving through the countryside of an ultra-low-poly Soviet Union, collecting enough petty cash to keep the car in a functional state. Earning money can be as simple as gathering scrap on the side of the road, but it can also be as sophisticated as arbitraging commodities between cities. Regardless of how the player keeps the car operational, the goal is to make the trek from East Berlin to Istanbul. Now, Jalopy provides a glimpse into a period in Soviet history that doesn't receive a ton of attention. Following the Second World War, Joseph Stalin guided the country through a decade of economic recovery, resigning in 1952 as his health took a turn for the worse. Under Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev, the economy continued to grow, but when the rate of growth began to decline in the mid-60s, Khrushchev was dismissed by the Kremlin. Leonid Brezhnev was selected to be the country's next leader and to bring about economic expansion, marking the beginning of a period known as the Brezhnevian stagnation. In a bid to revitalize the stalled Soviet economy, Mikhail Gorbachev was elected to the general secretaryship in 1985. In Gorbachev's view, the path to prosperity was liberalization, and as such, he loosened the state's centralized control of businesses and lifted restrictions on public discourse. With a for-profit model replacing the previous subsidies and price controls, inflation struck the price of necessities like food, and the disaffected Soviet citizens used their newfound free speech to openly criticize and demonstrate against the government. The veil of the Soviet Union had been lifted, and the structural faults were put on full display. In 1988, the growing discontent reached a boiling point. On March 30th, the Parliament of the Estonian Soviet Socialist Republic declared independence, stating that the country had been under illegal Soviet occupation since 1940. Latvia, Lithuania, and Azerbaijan followed suit in 1989, and meanwhile, a civil war had erupted in Caucasia. On request of Gorbachev, all 15 Soviet republics held democratic elections in 1990, and in six of those republics, the Communist Party lost. Despite attempts by Gorbachev to protect the Union by redefining the state's powers, the writing was on the wall. In December of 1991, representatives from each of the signatory parties to the Treaty on the Creation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics gathered in Belarus to sign the Beloveja Accords, a document representing an agreement by all parties that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist. It is in this political upheaval that Jalopy finds its setting. The thing is, Jalopy isn't about the Soviet Union. It's not about communism or economic stagnation. The setting is so specific that I thought it had to be commentary, but I couldn't quite figure out what it was trying to say, so I went straight to the source. I reached out to the game's sole developer, Greg Prismachuk, with my interpretation of the game. I talked about Brezhnev and economic hardship. I talked about autocracy. I mentioned that I detected subtle messages both supporting and rejecting communism, and in the politest way possible, he told me that I was completely wrong. Jalopy is a game about people. It's not meant to be a critique of the Soviet system. It was, in fact, born of Prismachuk's frustration over developers tending to put politics before people. That's why the narrative has virtually nothing to do with the Soviet Union's ongoing collapse. It's why you're on this trip with your uncle, why you can delve into his backstory through hidden letters and notes, and somewhat paradoxically, it's why he doesn't talk about his personal life with you. He has stowed himself away in an emotional fortress. In the words of the developer, it is a Berlin Wall of the mind. Jalopy's perspective is a rejection of the exact analysis that I tried to perform, created years before I had even heard of the game. I was put into checkmate by someone who did not even know that we were playing chess, and I loved it. It's time to retire the big bad Soviet foe trope. Given the importance of the USSR over the last century, it would be ridiculous to suggest that storytellers just ignore the country entirely, but a paradigm shift is in order. We can start to think about the country not as a geopolitical threat, but as a historical setting to be explored and experienced. By virtue of being a game about people, Jalopy is exactly that. I enjoyed every game that I talked about in this video, but at this point, what are we getting out of stories about Soviet science gone wrong or total nuclear annihilation? I am emphatically not saying that every game should strive to be an innovative cultural contributor. 
there are still new Tetris releases and they are still as awesome as the original version developed by Alexei Pajitnov in his Moscow office. But video games allow for a totally novel way to interact with their settings, so the number of games that end up being just more of what we've already seen feels like a waste. I like Black Ops and Atomic Heart, they're fun games, but I really like Jalopy and Pathologic because they're something more, and I don't think I'm speaking for just myself when I say that there is an appetite for more of this. Developers are going to continue to churn out first person shooters with the Soviet Union as the antagonist because people will continue to buy those games, but that shouldn't stand in the way of the more aspirational pursuit of pushing the boundaries of the medium. Thank you for watching.